Um, so if I could ask Nilin uh, to come up, he'll be telling us about, um, what will he be telling us about? He'll be telling us about radio astronomy and Meerkat in five minutes. Um, there's an HDMI thing over here. So I'm not very good at jokes, but because I expected video trouble, I prepared one. So. Racist. So at this conference we have, oh yeah, I'm saved from having to tell my joke. <laughs> oh, uh, for the lightning talk speakers, there's a microphone here. Oh, um, oh, so I realized yesterday we forgot to tell you how to stop lightning talk speakers if they go on too long. Um, so the way you do it is that um, once they reach their five minute limit, and if I start clapping with two fingers like this, um, then you can all start clapping with two fingers. <laughs> um, and um, if they're still going, uh, say, 20 seconds later, you can just turn it, turn it into uproarious applause. <laughs> I can see or um, I can get one for you. That would be nice. <laughs> hey, you, can, you can all read all the information on the introductory slides along. You see, it's, uh, <laughs> that's who I am and where I'm from, so I don't have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go. Okay. So radio telescopes, we're building Meerkat uh, close to here. This is a, what you might recognize as a telescope, smaller one, a bigger one, optical telescope, but we do radio telescopes, they can look like this or that. Um, why do we have radio telescopes? They show you different things. That is an optical image, that is a radio image of exactly the same thing, no it's not rotated, and that's what they look like when you put them together. Okay, so who's this? This guy is William, yes, 1800, William Herschel, and <laughs> he did this funny experiment. He wanted to measure the temperature of light. Yes, he put it through a prism, and he wanted to see which color is the hottest, and he found the color there beyond the red, which you can't see is the hottest, and that turned out to be infrared, so people discovered the spectrum. 1865, James Clark Max Maxwell, he's my hero. I did electromagnetics, PhD, anyway, so he put it all together, and we have a spectrum. So. Visible light is nothing but electromagnetics. Where's the timer I can see over there? Okay, and, but radio waves are all also. So right at the bottom we have low frequencies, radio waves, and at the top we have X-rays, ultraviolet, gamma ray, all the nasty stuff you don't want in you, but it's all the same kind of physics. Okay, what's the sun? The sun is a really hot bag of gas, just like me, which makes it a black body <laughs> radiator, which means it radiates a full electromagnetic spectrum. So for the sun, I think it's about 5,000 Kelvin. Most of the energy is in infrared, which is why it was the hottest. But it extends all the way out into the long wavelengths into radio, which means you can observe it. So we are on Earth. We have to look through the sky. And there's uh, called windows. So obviously, at the very X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, luckily for us, they're blocked by the atmosphere. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. Well, we've all been in the long run, but sooner. And that's the... Uh, Visible spectrum, obviously visible light comes through, but you see there's also a nice window for radio waves, which is why we can have radio telescopes on Earth. That's an optical image, same thing, radio. That's hydrogen gas mainly, what are stars made out of? Hydrogen gas, so if you want to see how stars are made, you use a radio telescope, one of the things. Jansky, 1950, Carl Jansky, first radio telescope, looked like that. 1958, uh, Rieber built this 19 in his own backyard, right? And then what happens since then? Well, telescopes got bigger. Ignore the math. Basically, if you make it bigger, it's more sensitive, which means you can see dimmer stars, and it also improves your resolution. The bigger it is, the finer your image. So people started building bigger and bigger, and oh boy, it can collapse like that. That's not so good. So you might have seen this in a James Bond movie. That's a receiver. 
Very recently, the uh, Chinese built fast 500 meter telescope. It's the biggest one on Earth. Obviously, it's China. But so it's very sensitive. But for the resolution, it still sucks. So what you do is interferometry. You have more than one telescope. You put them apart. And the further they are apart, the better your resolution is. You would have seen that in contact. The movie, um, and it, yep, that's the radio telescope, VLA or EVLA, somewhere in America. And you can see here, if your telescopes are placed one kilometer apart, that's your resolution. If you take the same dishes, place them 36 kilometers apart, you get much higher resolution. So, our stuff is here in the middle of a groove. There's no one there because we hate radio waves. Radio waves stuff our stuff up. Um, that's CAT7. It's our little training wheel telescope, about the smallest useful one. Finished around 2011, still kind of used. We're building Meerkat now. It's state of the art. It's going to be kind of the best telescope by many measures when it's done. Um, and certainly the most kind of technologically advanced one. And uh, it's going to be 64. This is before any of them were built. At the moment, 16 are working and doing science. Uh, they've got lots of cool stuff. Uh, you can have different radio frequency bands. There's a thing which rotates them in. It's got a main reflector, sub reflector. Gives you a very good antenna performance. There's some close-ups for you. Very pretty. Inside the receiver, got lots of cool electromagnetic stuff. I used to do electromagnetic, so it's it me. And there's a carousel. It rotates to select different frequency bands, right? Okay, digitizer, 1.72 gigahertz. Lots of data, about 30 gigabits per second per antenna. And here's our underground layer. Um, it's, yes, it's to hide the radio waves. There's an RFI airlock. So one door opens, you go in, the other door opens, right? That's our data center, rotary, UPSs. Okay, why am I showing you all this stuff? Oh, FPGA boards doing a lot of that processing, a lot of them. And here's our first light image. Um, no time to explain, trust me, it's awesome. Okay, <laughs> and there's going to be this international project called SKA, and it's going to be even bigger. So why are we, what do I do? I do the control and monitoring software. It's got some architecture, some web front end stuff, lots of our own protocol, CATCP in the middle. And at the bottom, you have some uh, low level devices, but we make them all speak CATCP. And it's a lot of fun to work on. You get to play with all those toys. And because the control and monitoring team has to understand all the subsystems, we talk to the scientist guys, we talk to the science processing guys, we talk to the um, you know, FPGA guys, and we're hiring. So thank you very much. Cool. Ooh, right on time. Uh, Anna. Oh. Thank you, Nidin, for probably the fastest introduction to radio astronomy that anyone here has experienced. <laughs> so, here. Yes. Uh, next up, Anna is going to be Anna Makaruta is going to be speaking to us about PyCon Zimbabwe. Wait, I can see a cursor. Yay! So, so maybe I will have to tell my joke. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm not building it up too much. <laughs> um, there's also a problem that I only have one joke, and there's still a few more lightning talks. <laughs> so I'm going to keep playing for time. <laughs> OK, OK, OK. <laughs> um, so there two kinds of um, Python people attending this conference. Uh, web developers, sysadmins, astronomers. Sorry, there are three kinds of people <laughs> attending this Python conference. Web developers, sysadmins, astronomers, biologists. Sorry, there are four. Sorry, among the diverse kinds of people <laughs> attending this Python conference are web developers, sysadmins, astronomers, biologists, school children, architects, and lots more. <laughs> Looks like we're on. Yay! Cool, you ready? Yeah.
just want to test the mic quickly. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Anna Makarudze. I'm here to talk about uh, our first pike on Zimbabwe. So it will be taking place on the 24th and to the 25th of November at CESA Training Center uh, in Belvedere, Harare. So uh, this is the first PyCon to be held in Zimbabwe. It will be a uh, two-day event, and it aims to promote the use of uh, Python programming language in Zimbabwe. And it also aims to grow the Python community in Zimbabwe. So we also hope to uh, promote uh, networking opportunities for our young people so that we create uh, employment for them probably through remote, remote working or, or getting employed um, elsewhere outside Zimbabwe because we've got a high unemployment rate. Then we also, we are targeting a number of hundred uh, participants. We are trying to start small and uh, this includes uh, participants of uh, Django Girls Workshop. So uh, we hope to have a workshop uh, like the one you see in the picture before. The reason for this is uh, I shared uh, earlier on in the, uh, in the morning uh, in my talk that most of, Zim most of the Zimbabweans, people who have uh, laptops, they are currently using them to do software piracy and music. So we are trying to introduce them to programming by uh, having workshops that will teach them uh, Python and hopefully they will utilize their IT resources in a better way than pirating music and software. So we are calling for your support. You can see uh, inform more information on the event on, uh, sorry, uh, that's the wrong, wrong it's supposed to be zw.pycon.org. Then uh, if you want to email us and or sponsor us, you can get in touch with us at uh, zim.pycon at gmail.com. Or you can uh, support our crowdfunding project on 1% Club. Then you can also propose a talk. We are looking for speakers and we are hoping that uh, you can support us by coming to Zimbabwe and uh, giving a talk. Then you can also tour our, uh, our country. We've got uh, Victoria Falls, Great, Zimb uh, Great Zimbabwe and Kariba Dam. So you can make an early, early day by visiting Zimbabwe. You attend PyCon and then we'll probably you promote our industry by doing some bit of tourism. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we next. Hello, yes. Hello. Yes, you're um, Next up, we have Will, who will telling, be telling us about um, Ginger Two. Um, well, Will is well. Actually, sorry, the Ginger Two command line interface. Did people? How many people knew that Ginger Two had a command line interface? It doesn't have its own. There are two other ones. But I'll get to that <laughs> um, so, yes. Um, watch. Um, so watching Anna's talk, I th and I think you should aim for 150, then you can claim to have had a bigger PyCon than Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that will encourage more people to attend. Um, some of you might also be wondering what the 1% club is um, that was mentioned on... Is anyone actually wondering? <laughs> how, how many people know what it is? Hi, so... It's, it's not actually an investment club for the people from Wall Street. <laughs> um, they, they were unlucky enough to um, name themselves that uh, before. And the idea is that you, by just donating kind of 1% of your income, you can make a difference. Um, um, and yeah, so they do uh, crowdfunding. They're actually helping fund uh, PyCon Zimbabwe because the United States put in place uh, essentially sanctions against Zimbabwe, which has meant that a lot of US companies can't fund them. Um, so for example, the Python Software Foundation, who funds pretty much every PyCon around the world, uh, can't fund PyCon Zimbabwe directly because of the, the sanctions. I was fixing the arrangement first. Are you good to go? Uh, as soon as JP is happy with my font size. It, is that fine when it's not being a douche? Cool. Uh, not that one. 
Huh? <laughs> um, so everyone knows what Jinja 2 is, right? Yes, people have used Jinja 2. It's like Django templating, but crazy. Uh, well, you can do crazy things. Uh, so someone else actually told me about Jinja 2 CLI, and there's sort of an awkward part where you'll see that I'm using two different versions because they're two completely independent libraries that do similar things, but then this one you call this way, and it supports YAML, but not environment variables, and then this one you call this way, and it supports environment variables. But the reason it was cool, or why I started using it, because you can, sometimes when you start trying to do like string replacement in files, it can get really crazy. Like if you use sed, you can do that, or you can use bash replacement, which doesn't want to exist because I can't type, where you can do stuff like that. Oh, first, uh, my typing is bad. Uh, yes, let me look there. That works. OK, cool. So that's like my normal variable that I'm using in bash, right? So it just has that message example. And you can do a bash replacement like that. And you can do that said replacement like that, but then when you try to do more complicated things with said, first it looks like that, and then it starts looking more like that, which sort of sucks, which is the thing you have to do for Docker with PHP, because it sucks. Um, <laughs> and then you also have people writing said stuff on OSX, and then, where is it? Oh, the man page. Uh, and then you see for Ubuntu said needs that suffix, and if you put a space after the dash i, it complains that the file doesn't exist and does weird, crazy other stuff. But why this was useful to me is because in my free time, I like making myself unhappy, so I run some help with some Counter-Strike servers, and the only access they're willing to give you is shitty FTP access. So then you have a file like this. Ah, why am I? Let me look there, like JP said. So then you have a file like that, where originally I tried doing said replacements with just like a list of said in place replacements, which were crap. But then I was like, someone else told me about Jinja 2 CLI, which this one supports Python 3, so this one's also better because this virtual env is Python 3. Um, and the other one has some uses base string and they haven't merged the pull request to support Python 3. And then with this, you can do cool things like somewhere there I have a thing where. Because I have access on FTP for that, I go through all the files and do, oh, so I have an example with this where I use a JSON file, where I have that that says message and an example. And then what's cool about, because it's Jinja 2, you can also start doing some crazy stuff like include other ones and then you can do, where, sure, like that, or then do it for the other HTML one and then it obviously includes the other one. And it's quite useful. I've used it to rewrite YAML with Jinja 2 because I'm crazy and it's stupid. Um, but it works really well, um, as long as everyone writes good stuff. But then this works. And I use this like, where's an example? So I do stuff like that, where then you do these also these two libraries, which are sort of similar. Oh, so I'm using the wrong one here. This one supports input template, then input data, and then J2, which I have globally installed, supports the template and then the input data. Um, but then you do server oh, one.yaml and server.cfg, and then what did I do wrong? <laughs> did I get them the wrong way around? Maybe? Yes, and then it has it printed out with the Jinja 2 stuff, which is useful when instead of two, you have, instead of one server, you have six, like that one that has an IP over there. Um, <laughs> but then what I like wrote some, <laughs> it has a password, it's bad because it's normal bash, but people that run game servers are stupid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but that's basically it, use Jinja, like it's, Jinja 2 CLIs, either of them are both cool when like, you don't want to use a full configuration management thing, but you want to like, find and replace bash, or like stuff in templates. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Oh, 
next up we have um, Jessica, and now I have to pronounce her surname correctly, <laughs> uh, Upani. Yes. Woohoo! <laughs> she's probably just being nice. Um, she's going to be talking about PyCon Namibia. Um, and oh, is it on? Hello. JP, stop. JP, stop switching the mics off. Hello. Okay, are you ready? I am, but my computer seems... Yes, but we're still waiting to get stuff on the screen. Oh, we can see the cursor. Mm. Can we drag this across? Well, I actually went to PyCon Namibia um, at the start of this year, um, and I had a really great time. So um, I'm sure Jessica will be giving you lots of reasons to attend, um, but I can just say plus one from my side. Um, very worthwhile going. Hmm. <laughs> Yes? I have an emergency joke question. <laughs> hmm, how bad is it? <laughs> You'll need to know about the rats. Oh dear, it's that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so, yes, uh, things are happening after Lightning Talks. Um, we'll have our final keynote um, by Maciej on how your development processes affect your team. And after that, as you've heard, there'll be drinks um, in the room across the hall. Yes, yes. Um, and yes, apparently lots of ice cream and some sort of VR room. Okay, we're ready to go. Hello, everybody again. Okay, so in 2015, we had our very first Python conference and it was called Python Namibia. And in 2016, this year, we also had our second one, and now we could have the PyCon uh, name to our conference. So next year, we are hosting another one, a third one, on the 20th to the 24th of February. So yes, so that's where Namibia is. <laughs> 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 And I'm inviting all of you to come to Namibia, uh, and I hope all 300 of you go there because, I mean, we are just 2 million anyway. We'll all fit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we hosted our conference at the University of Namibia. We had 118 attendees, of which 50% were women. We had visitors from South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Nigeria, UK, Netherlands, Germany, Canada, USA, Brazil. And if your country is not on the list, please come so that it's also on the list. We had 63 Namibian students, of which seven were high school learners. We had 32 jungle girls uh, attendees, so that was good. Um, we normally have four days uh, of workshops, introductory workshops, jungle girls, and two days of talks and more advanced workshops. Okay, so our jungle girls workshop was on the very first day before everything else started. Okay. These are our amazing sponsors who made it possible for us to have Python, Python Namibia. And then we have the Cardiff University Phoenix Project. This has been a magical contributor to our Python conference. They, uh, initiated, they are initiated in, in um, Cardiff and they uh, work with the University of Namibia. They have worked with us, uh, with the university, on different other faculties like the medicine and um, mathematics as well. So um, what they do is they have, a, um, I think it's called a summer school where the first year mathematicians, before they get into university, they are given a, a, a week of training to be introduced to the different mathematics and so forth. So these guys have been very good to us. We also got 50 Raspberry Pis at the previous Python conference and uh, given to us by PSF and the Phoenix Project. Pinam got eight Raspberry Pis. 
We also got to give a few raspberry pies to our neighbors, Zim. I don't know how many, I forgot how many there were, but yes. Okay, so yes, this was a setup of the raspberry pies. This was all just raspberry pies, and yeah, everybody had fun. And then as you can see, we had school learners, and this guy here, his name is um, Sam. He was one of the f uh, computer science graduates, and he did his fourth year project on Python. He did a queuing system, okay? Um, yes, so this was our Jungle Girls workshop. We also had a learner there, representing us two learners actually. We had 32 participants, we had um, attendees from South Africa, we had coaches from South Africa, Nigeria, Zimbabwe, and I think also Senegal. Um, where was Ibrahim from? Yeah, so we had other African countries also helping us. <coughs> Good, we didn't just have Python, we also had local developers, professionals, uh, web companies, uh, PHP, Java Mobile, and other mobile developers, and so forth. We didn't just focus on Python alone. Okay, so yes, we had media coverage also from our local televisions, and some of us got to speak in the radio for the first time. And yes, so we had Daniele also on the television, and he was introduced as Python Software. So that's, <laughs> that's how, <laughs> that's how famous Python is in Namibia, so d don't worry. We had very interesting talks. Um, we got to uh, have a talk from Simon, so yeah, uh, and Anna also, and, and many more. We had very interesting talks. We had a long queue of lightning talks, which I have not seen here, surprisingly. Um, I expected a very long line of Python, uh, of, of lightning talks, but I haven't seen that. So hopefully next time I come here, I see a very long line of lightning talks. Um, yes, so the outcome has been really magnificent. We have uh, initiated the Python scholars uh, out, out, out of Python Namibia, and these guys have participated in a programming competition and they got second place already, so it's, it's good. We are expecting more and more better things. And then again, things are not always going to be perfect at Python conferences. Here, we, during our Python conference, our students decided that fees must go down. <laughs> So they closed the whole university and we lost the whole day. For a day we could not have our Python conference. So, so yeah. So in 45 minutes we found a booking for the second day, for the following day and then, yes, we went on. <laughs> okay, so come to Namibia, to our wonderful, beautiful desert and everything and get a free turn also. It's very hot sometimes, so you can get a free turn. Uh, yeah, so that's our website. Thank you. So, um, downstairs during the conference, um, Lisa and Cody, who are up next, were running Django Girls. White cable. More applause. <laughs> and they're going to be telling us about that. Hi, everyone. These are not the Django girls. Pull it out. Okay. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Cody, this is Lisa, and we're going to be speaking a little bit, yeah, we're going to be speaking a little bit about Django Girls, um, but firstly, who are we? Like I said, I'm Cody, I am uh, 23, I'm a software developer at precult.org, uh, I studied computer science and computer games development at UCT. Um, I'm Lisa, I'm 26 years old, and I also work for precult.org, I'm a project manager, and 
I studied um, journalism. <laughs> <laughs> so what is Django Girls? Django Girls was started in 2014 um, in Europe by two Polish ladies called Ola and Ola. And what the initiative plans to, what their aims are is um, they plan to br bridge the gap in the field, uh, the gender gap within the field. And how they do this is they run one-day workshops that teaches women um, how to create a blog using uh, Python, Django, HTML, CSS, um, as well as installing tools like GitHub, JavaScript, and so on. Um, yeah. So what is Django Girls Cape Town? We, uh, we decided to build on top of that and, and introduce this in Cape Town. And what we really plan to do is give girls a good first experience with code. Like the gentleman uh, mentioned before in the panel talk is that his daughter actually went to a, uh, a class and it was full of boys and she was the only girl. And unfortunately, many girls have the same experience and they actually leave coding or they leave the field because of that. And we plan to create workshops that give girls a good first experience with code so that they can actually be comfortable and learn to code in that environment and see if it's actually something that they want to do. Yeah. Do you want to add anything? To that? Um, yeah, I think with, uh, with Cape Town, we're really eager to get high school girls involved in this initiative, and especially matriculants this year, um, just to give them some exposure, um, and especially girls who don't have a plan, um, who don't know what they're going to study next year, just to um, talk to us and, and, and find out more about what we're doing. Yeah, we actually had um, a student uh, down here now uh, studying PPE, and she actually, after speaking to Michelle, decided that she wants to go and study computer science. Um, so yeah, woohoo. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we just want to say thank you to all the sponsors, um, Precult.org, Amazon Web Services, as well as uh, Python Software Foundation for supporting our initiative. And if any of you guys want to support our next initiative, um, please email Cape Town at djangogirls.org. Uh, Lisa and I really plan to make this a community within Cape Town, um, and we're also planning on bringing a kids program very soon, so, yeah. yeah. And also, we just want to say uh, congratulations to the girls who participated over the past two days. Um, you did really well, and we are super proud of you. So, we'd like to give you a round of applause. <laughs>
along the lines of Linux requirements dot in and dot text or what the wonderful Windows ones in Windows dot dot dot. Right. And for development environments, as Bruce Murray said, you need a virtual env so you can switch your package set when your branches change. We're not like these web startups that have just one running branch. We support our customers on versions we released in 2010, and so you have to be able to still use those versions yourself. And since we're running multiple languages, we need equivalent stacks. Um, there's this thing called NPM, if you're running JavaScript stuff in Node, and like, it's weird. Um, at this point, all the poetry breaks down because I'm no longer in Python world, and so this is going to get technical. So you, they have this thing in NPM called NVM, which is for multi-versioning, but it works a bit differently from Python virtual ends because um, you get all your packages actually stored in a directory called node modules underneath your project directory, and so NVM just manages how many versions of node you have installed. So pinning versions as well is slightly tricky, grumble, grumble. There's NPM shrink wrap, which saves a pinned version, but then updating versions will require further work, and it's not also quite so nice. But for Joy, we have Java as well. And for Java, multi-versioning is relatively easy. Computers have been trained since young for many JREs. And packages can be managed with such things as Gradle and so on. So you can do that. But what we really need is some kind of unified stack. Um, so to unify these all, we have a script that runs when activating your virtual env. So you get the right version of Java, Node, et cetera, and then undoing those when you deactivate. So that's made our life a lot easier, because otherwise you have some funny bug because you're running the wrong version of Java. That's boring. And then there's Windows. So. <laughs> On Windows, there are two varieties of virtual env, one made for command prompt and one made for PowerShell. They put things in strange places. All the EXEs are in the script subdirectory for some strange reason. So you have to adapt your code to handle that, rinse, grumble, and repeat. And then there's the matter of Windows binary. So um, for non-peer Python modules, um, you can listen to Paul Kerr's talk he did earlier about how hard it can be to actually get hold of the right binaries and produce them and so on. And then you often can't install them easily in virtual ends with pip, but you have to trick them fitting in with pipping easy install, which is something that my colleague Matt wrote, which is like, ah, just patch this thing so that the installer works and goes into the virtual env. And you'll also need to bootstrap. So for that, you actually need to install Python in the first place. And so you can use something called Chocolatey, which is not a package manager, but pretend that it could be. And then... <laughs> And that all the above assumes that the code remains available. The internet, it turns out, is not that reliable. Some projects even have a policy to wipe out useful history. In Minch Magic Grumble, doesn't Grumble see a Grumble need to keep old Grumble binaries? Grumble moan. They actually like answer questions about where are the old binaries gone with, but you don't need those. You've got a new version. <laughs> so, and sometimes you might also fork a project just internally, perhaps while waiting for your patches to finally land upstream. So you need a place for those binaries to live that people can access. So. You can run your own repository server, and that will set you free to keep your package versions for as long as long can be, and not depend on funny sites on strange web hosting plans when you need an urgent bug fix and it's way past half past three. Nexus is quite good. It's a repository thing. and supports a variety of platforms, and it's just added the Python packaging infrastructure. It can host Python packages for you, which is quite good. So pin your Python packages and pick them quite precisely for programmers and products parceled off to punny places. Alliterate your lightning talks with lots of little limes. And share what you have learned with me. I'm working at J5, so you can email me. And just like everyone else, we're actually friendly. <laughs>